Uh, we're going to, I'm going to start off and then my husband is going to f finish up. Uh, and my title today is kind of a little strange. It's called Some Things I've Learned Along the Way. You know, as you already know, we're nearing our eighth decade. And I just celebrated this January, this past January, my 70th spiritual birthday. Amen. I received the Holy Ghost 70 years ago this past January. And I have celebrated now my 68th year of having been called by God. I was called by God to serve in some sort of ministry when I was 10 years old. And it happened, and I want to just tell you briefly, this is just kind of talking to you. But you never know who you're going to touch. My dad was pastoring a little church, and there was a young woman that had come into the church that I admired greatly. She was a young businesswoman, and uh, she dressed nice, and she really, when she came to the Lord, she really gave her heart wholehearted. And she had come to my mother and said, I want to do something, but I don't know what I can do. And she said, I think I might like to teach some children. So mother suggested that perhaps she put together what we called a little Bible club. And we met on Sunday afternoons, and uh, it was just a little group of children, my eight, nine, ten years old. And on this particular Sunday afternoon, it was raining, bad weather, there were just a few of us there. And Sister Jackie stood in front of us and she talked about presenting yourselves holy, you know, the scripture, to serve the Lord. And there was just something about the way she talked. It was so sincere. She didn't have any big pictures to show, nothing fancy. She just stood there with her Bible in her hand, but big tears were running down her cheeks as she talked to us about presenting ourselves holy to the Lord. And at 10 years old, on that Saturday afternoon, I was called by God. Amen. That has been 68 years ago, and I have been happily serving God in every way I could. I have concentrated my effort of study for 66 years. I started when I was 12 years old, and by the time I was 14, I had organized my own Bible club and teaching children. And in fact, I started uh, seeing my husband when I was 17, teaching a vacation Bible school at his local church. <laughs> And that was my second summer to travel all summer doing vacation Bible schools. So he was talking to us about where we all came from. Well, that's where I came from. And now, uh, you know, life is uh, it's a, su a succession of seasons. I am very much a believer in seasons. And there are seasons, acceptable seasons, times when God has a special touch and then there are the winter seasons when you feel like you've been stripped bare. But one thing about winter, it always has the promise that spring's coming. Right. So you just may as well understand that life moves in season. I want to talk to you a little bit, because we do have a mixed crowd, about how your seasons progress. In your 20s, you are... You, now, this doesn't hold true, you know, non-negotiable, non but... Basically, it is. In your 20s, you're deciding who you are. You're deciding what you'll give your life to. You're finding out what your giftings are. And it's important to know what your giftings are because the, you were, they were placed in you for a particular reason. Then in your 30s, who's 30 here? Who's in their 30s? A lot of 30s. You're discerning your potential. You're beginning to really figure out what you can do, and you're gaining confidence. In your 40s, you're determining your direction, the, where you will really head in life, what you will really do. And on, in your 40s, you're on the edge of your most productive years. And your 50s distills your life. That's the essence of who you have become. 
The 60s, you define your life. It's the big statement of your life. When you hit 60, you're heading toward the time when you can be slowed down. You never know how life is going and it defines your life. In your 70s, you're displaying your totality and when you reach your 80s, only God knows. <laughs> but I would like to say that somewhere in that 60s, 70s in there, it is also the time to abdicate your place. It is, and when I say abdicate, I don't mean you quit doing anything, but you start bringing new, fresh, young, younger people alongside of you and train them to take your place. That can be a weakness because sometimes we are, we have the feeling that our identity is nothing more than what we do, but your identity is who you are, not just what you do. And I just want to urge everybody that is in their 60s from that on up to start looking for people to bring alongside of you and train them and commit to them and help them. And then don't be afraid to turn loose and let them take it. I have had one of the greatest joys of my life in, in North America. Uh, I was kind of the, the mother of all the women's conferences and we had some mighty and huge women's conferences. And anybody here ever was at one? Good deal. And uh, they, they were really major. They had a major impact. And um, it was about, oh, I don't know, I can't remember, but the young lady that I had kind of selected and moved her close to me, she was in her early, I don't know, I think she was still in her 30s at that time. And the first time I turned that whole women's conference over to her, she was terrified. My daughter was very sick at that time, and I had promised, uh, Brom promised her that I would be back for that opening night and uh, because she didn't want to do the keynote address. I flew in that afternoon from being with my daughter, and while I was in my study, hadn't even unpacked my bag, uh, I got a call and Terry had taken another really bad turn and I went straight back to the to the airport and left and left her with the whole conference. I knew she would be fine. She was terrified. But I want to tell you that she sent me the video of that service uh, by quick mail. I, th I think it was the next day or the day after. And when we sat down, Terry and I together, Terry had worked with me an awful lot and watched that. That was one of the greatest days of my life to see somebody that I had helped and trained and to see her take over. And I haven't touched one of them since. They are still going and doing wonderfully. Don't be afraid at that season of your life to move on ahead and become the support for the younger generation. That's healthy. That's very healthy. So what you are is God's gift to you. What you become is your gift to God. Because we have to work on the God puts, he puts a lot of things in us, but you have to discover what God has put in you and then you have to sharpen those things. It's important to know who you are. Let me give you a little illustration from my own life. I have a very good friend. Any of you ever heard of Merle and Joan Ewing? She's a great singer. She's a great musician, songwriter. Joan and I grew up together. We're just a month apart in our, our age, and uh, she's just a wonderful musician. Well, when I was a teenager, if you was going to marry a preacher, you had to play an accordion and sing. <laughs> And I tried, <laughs> but nobody ever asked me to take the solo in a choir. <laughs> and I struggled with the piano and with the accordion. And I could have wasted my life by trying to become Joan, but I was not gifted with that. Now I can play, I can carry a tune, uh, in a pinch, I can get it done, but that is not my giftings. 
find out who you are. And if you haven't discovered who you are when you're 40, it's not too late. So find out who you are and then spend your time developing what you can become and become the best you that you can be. I love study and teach it. That is my, it's my, it's just everything to me. It's, it's, that's no, it's, it's no big job to me because I just love it so much. And because that's what God put in me. I'm, a, I'm an organizer. I love to organize. I'm a note maker. I organize everything, including my husband. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you need to know who you are and don't let anybody else write your job description. You know what you're for. And every, everybody has giftings. The scripture, you know, it's debatable, but... There's some people say there's as many as 26 to 30 gifts mentioned in the scripture. And what there is not one of us, not one of you, who does not have particular gifts. Did you know there is a gift to hospitality even? And five times the scripture tells us to be hospitable. And three of those times is to ministry. And you know, it, there are some people that it, they just know how to be hospitable. That's a gift from God. Whatever it is, you learn to use it. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they had spent all those years there and they had worked hard, but they took the giftings and the, learn, the things they had learned in Egypt, they took out of Egypt. And those were the skills they used to build the tabernacle and all the other things. They learned their skills and they took their skills that they learned from what we would say the world and they transferred that into kingdom work. So whatever your giftings are, whatever you're good for, whatever you're good at, look for places to interpret that into kingdom things. You know, even if you're just good with a computer, there's always things like that that need to be done at the church. Learn to adapt what you do as a person and interpret it into kingdom. Y'all understand what I'm saying? I, I strongly believe in that. And my husband has already told you, use the scripture about sanctify you Holy Spirit, soul, and body. I like to think of those things as a three-legged stool. I wrote a little booklet. I didn't have any with me, but on the three-legged stool. You need to have balance in life. A three-legged stool is a very sturdy stool unless one leg is loose. And if one leg on a three-legged stool is not good and tight, you're in danger. And we are made up spirit, soul, and body. And we need to be balanced in life. You know, there's some people that can be so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. Amen. And then there are other people that are so tied to the earth that they cannot see heavenly things for the dust of earth in their eyes. So learn to live a balanced life. Now, I just want to mention uh, the secular and the sacred. To me, they're homogenized. Ye serve the Lord Christ. That's one of my favorite little phrases in the scripture. I've had it underlined for years. Whatever you're doing, you're supposed to be doing it as unto the Lord. Amen. So that tells me that the secular and the sacred are one. Now let me give you a little illustration from my own life. A job description, I have a job description in the scripture. I'm a woman. As a woman, I have certain job descriptions. I'm to be a keeper of the home. I am to love my husband. I am to love my children. I, I take that seriously, keeper of the home, very seriously. The way I keep my house is important to me. You may say, well, I thought you'd be reading your Bible and praying all the time. No, God made me a woman. Yes, Spiritually, I'm a son because I have all the rights of the sonship. But my earthly job description is I'm a woman. This could go for a man. As a man, you have a job description to love your wife, to provide for your household. Those things are not just separate and secular. 
they are sacred because it's included in what God has put there. The, um, the little incident I wanted to tell you about is one of the largest conferences we ever had. I used to call them, say we used to have big women's conferences. But after I gained weight, I quit saying big women's conferences. <laughs> I say we had big conferences for women. <laughs> that sounds a lot better, doesn't it? And I mean, it was a huge conference. It, it was the crowd, we have this big tabernacle and the crowd was so big that my husband literally had to come get me from the platform at the end of service and I had to go up through the choir loft because you couldn't move through the crowd. And uh, it had been a you know heavy workload getting ready for it. My daughter and my daughter-in-law <coughs> had both been right beside me working with it. And I went home uh, after the great service that night and um, each of them had a, a little girl, toddler, and uh, the, ch the babies were tired and we were all tired and the babies were whiny and so, you know, I took one of them, I said, let me, let me go bathe her. So I took the baby, took her to the bathtub, bathed her, put her little nightgown on her. By then the other one had had her bath and I went to the den and picked up the other little two-year-old and went to my rocker to sit down and rock her to sleep. And I will never forget it. It's one of those benchmarks in my life. I was sitting there holding that little toddler, rocking her to sleep, humming to her. And the Lord spoke to me. And he said, what you're doing now is as important to me as what you did when you stood before those 8,000 women. Because what kind of a woman would I be that I would give all of my energies to 8,000 people I didn't even know and didn't have time to show a little tenderness and love and special attention to my own grandchild, great-grandchild. So you see, it's important that, uh, that you understand everything is sacred. Everything is sacred. And when you're serving your family, that is still spiritual. When you're serving in the church or when you're serving in your neighborhood, you may not be on your knees, but it's still spiritual because you serve the Lord Christ and you do all as unto Him. And we cannot separate the sacred and the secular. It's all sacred before God. So, you know, there is no, no part of life that is not sacred before Him. And there's no aspect of your life that should grow stale. There is no need to grow stale. If you grow stale, it's laziness. God did not intend for us to live a stale life. There's too much of wonder in everything in life. He breathed life into Adam. So your, our very life is God breathed. And we, sh we cannot let it become stale. Your relationship with God. You know, you're, you're blessed to be called a bride. In the Old Testament, Israel was referred to as a wife. In the New Testament, the church is referred to as the bride. You know the difference between a bride and a wife? A wife has settled into routine and it has become dutiful and sometimes drudgery. They do the same thing, but not from the same reason. A bride is still excited, still thrilled, still looking for ways to serve. Don't let your life grow stale. You are to be the bride of Christ. So, you know, relationship to God is um, so important. I've already touched on that this morning. But let me just talk to you, uh, say something to you about this business of your ages and how we dream and all this kind of stuff. But you may either your dreams, as you, as you get older, either your dreams will overshadow your memory or your memory will start overshadowing your dreams. Now I'm almost 79 and I am working hard on refusing to say, especially to younger people, 
I remember when we, let me tell you how we, when I start doing that, I'm living in memories. And I still have the life of Jesus Christ coursing through myself. And I am still excited about the kingdom. I, maybe I run into the future too hard, but I do not want memories to overshadow the dreams that I have. I still have some things I plan to do before my time is over. I am still excited about life. I still want to grow. I want to develop. I have seen, and maybe, maybe I, well, I started to say I've seen women do this, but I've seen everybody do it. At a certain point in life, you just kind of lay your brain up on a shelf and just continue on as you were. I don't understand that. There is too much excitement in life. There's too much wonder in life to, to let that happen. Do you know uh, Einstein, the scientist Einstein, was supposed to, supposed to be probably one of the most brilliant men that ever lived. And I read that they said that actually, as brilliant as he was, he only used 10% of his brain power. When you think how wonderfully made you are and what mankind is capable of doing, please don't sell yourself short. You are part of the wonderful, majestic works of God. You were created for purpose. Don't just dream your life away and let your brain just rust from disuse. Read, study, learn, reach out. Is this foreign talk to you? No. I think it is what God intended for us to do. So that's, that's I, I was talking to you about things I've learned along the way. So the day you stop dreaming is the day you've died. And spiritual maturity is determined by your dreams getting bigger, not smaller. And let me tell you this, the older you get, the more faith you ought to have. But that only comes if you have exercised your faith as you have grown older. So my conclusion is this, dream big, pray hard, think long, work faithfully. David, Daniel rather, prayed toward Jerusalem. Learn to pray toward your dreams. He never saw the fulfillment of what he prayed for, but he never quit praying toward Jerusalem. So you're part of the eternal. And I told you this morning, you will never fulfill everything that you dream of, but it's the dreams that push you on. What could you do if you really set your head to? What addition to the kingdom could you really become? Who could you really affect if you wanted to? Is there a 10-year-old in your church that you could take a little interest in that would produce some sort of ministry that would carry on long after you're gone? Look for ways to build the kingdom because you are part of God's grace, His goodness, His kingdom. You are designed by the divine and you're designed with purpose make sure you use it well some things i've learned along the way i hope they help you Amen. someone uh, I've, heard, I've, heard, I've heard preachers say don't ever question god well let me let me take that burden off of you. Jesus himself said, my God, my God, why is thou forsaken me? He questioned God. And I never find where God answered him. So Jesus died with some unanswered questions. And you are too, and I am too. God doesn't come down and explain himself to our vain minds. He just comes down and says, trust me. I told a group of preachers some time back, I said, God has never failed to answer my prayer. Of course, they looked at me kind of funny. I said, yeah. I said, oftentimes his answer is two words, trust me. 
Now that's not what I wanted to hear. That's not the full explanation I wanted, but that's an answer. Just trust me. And, and I've learned that in life. But there's times that the only thing you do is trust God. And you can't figure it out. You can worry and worry until, as we say down south where I'm from, you worry until you wear a cord on your brain. And that won't solve a thing. You just, uh, uh, you may as well turn it over to the Lord. When you come to Jesus, you've come to the Supreme Court of the universe. You cannot appeal your case any higher. So when you get there, rest your case. Just leave it with him. Here it is, Lord. I don't know what else to do, what else to say. I don't even know how else to pray. So I just uh, leave it with you. The Bible said, cast your care upon the Lord. He'll sustain thee. Never suffer the righteous. Uh, Peter said, cast your care on the Lord. He cares for you. Uh, I, I don't know if you do this here, but part of the country where I'm from, we fish by casting. They take a rod and reel. Do you do that here? And they cast. Well, that's our connotation in the United States of casting. You cast your lure out, pop, it hits the water. And then you, you know what you do? Give it back, give it back, give it back, give it back. <laughs> well, we cast our care upon the Lord. Here it is, Lord. Plop. Give it back, give it back, give it back, give it back. <laughs> but the Greek word and the Hebrew too for cast means to totally release and let go. But we've got this connotation, you know. Well, I've turned that over to the Lord. Here it comes back, you know. And when, when you get to God, you can't go any further. Let him have it. And just turn it over to him. And, uh, he may not work it out like you want it worked out. But he knows what. I have found out that God's a good God. And he's working for my benefit. Regardless of how it looks in the immediate, if you've got a word from the Lord, anything that happens to you between the giving of that word and fulfillment of that word is temporary. God gave Joseph a word. In fact, the Bible said he's declared the end of the beginning. And we start at the beginning. God declares the end and said it's settled. And then he begins at the beginning and works toward what he's already settled. And so he told you know, he, he gave Joseph a word. And the essence of it was you're going to end up on the throne in Egypt. And people are going to be bowing down to you. Well, it's 13 years before that happened. And he had to go through jealous brothers, put in a pit, sold to the Ishmaelite traders, put in Potiphar's house as a slave, lied on, thrown in prison, forgotten. But every bit of that was temporary it, it, because the end had been declared. So Jesus is the predestined Lord of the universe, uh, Paul said in the first chapter of uh, the Hebrews. So it, it, it's settled. If you trust God, he's declared the end from the beginning. Whatever you're in now is temporary. Yes. Just remember, it's going to turn out all right. It may look bad, but it's going to turn out all right because he's declared uh, the end from the beginning. And we all have these experiences in life. Uh, David, in the 30th chapter of 1 uh, uh, Samuel, he'd been out to battle. He came home to Ziglag, you remember? Everything was gone. Was their homes were burned, city was burned. Wives were captured, children. Everything they owned, all their livestock. Their homes were ripped and plundered. 600 men with him and, and uh, the men started talking about killing him and the scripture said that the men wept until there was no more power they're feeling sorry for themselves and their circumstances drained all the juices out of them great big burly strong soldiers wept till there was no more power but David got power out of this loss. Now, but the Bible said he was distressed. I know it did, but you know why he was distressed? He was distressed because of the people. Well, because of himself. You study the scriptures closely, you find out his distress came because of their reaction. Instead of them encouraging him, they start weeping. And then when there's no more power left, they start talking about killing him. 
Uh, and you get so distressed till you can worry and worry and worry till you're exhausted and all your energy is gone. Instead of understanding, I got a word from the Lord. David said, bring me that prayer shawl. And he got under it, and the Bible said he encouraged himself in the Lord. He reached into the past to get power for the present. When he faced Goliath, you know where he got the strength to face Goliath? He reached into the past. He said, God that took care of the barren life. My past experiences. Go take care of this uncircumcised Philistine. Why do you call him an uncircumcised Philistine? Because he wasn't in the covenant. A little bitty fella in the covenant is stronger than a great big Goliath that's not in the covenant. You get your comfort from your friends, but you, you get your promotions from your enemies. You know why, why the Lord sent such a big Goliath against him? Because God had a big promotion for him. He's going to be king. So if you're fighting the biggest battle you ever fought in your life, God must have a big promotion. <laughs> and reach into your past and, and remember, get you some power for the present. Has he ever failed you? He's not failed me. He's scared to live in day, daylights out of me several times. You know, I've wondered where it's gotten. Uh, hello, Lord, are you still there? And, well, these men, they wept till they just wept the power out. But David took the same circumstance and he got power out of it. And they, he got the men together and they finally said, okay, we'll go with you. Let's go get the Amalekites. And they got down to the river. And you know who they were going after? They were going after their wives. And they got to the river and 200, 200 of them said, we can't make it. We are exhausted. Now can you imagine when the other 400 got there and rescued their wives and the other wives said, where's our husband? I'm about to make trouble. Oh. <laughs> if mama ain't happy, they ain't nobody happy. <laughs> well, they said they were too tired to come. What? <laughs> Boy, don't you know that there was trouble when those boys did get home. But uh, circumstances, circumstances happen in life. Here's the thing, that was one of the lowest points in David's life because he'd lost his wife, his home, his children, lost everything, his, his men were going. Uh, that was the 30th chapter of uh, First Samuel. But the chronology tells us that the 30th, 31st chapter ran concurrently at the same time. What he didn't know was on the other side of the mountain, the last thing between him and the throne was being put to death. Saul was dying. So what was his lowest day was really his highest day. But he just couldn't see on the other side of the mountain. So when you think, my God, I've had it, this is it. You don't know what God's doing on the other side of the mountain. It may be the highest day of your life. Don't quit then. Uh, encourage yourself in the Lord if you can't find anything else. Just... But people weren't encouraging him. Circumstances weren't encouraging his eyesight. He could smell. The five senses weren't encouraging him. But there's that sixth, a supernatural sense that you got into where you get your courage. That God is going to work this thing out. I may not see it. I may not understand it. But there's something going on on the other side of the mountain that, uh, uh, that I, I, I can't see. For instance, when uh, Abraham was going up the mountain with Isaac Mount Moriah Isaac said well here's the fire and here's the wood and here's the knife where's the sacrifice now I've heard preachers say when Abraham saw the lamb he said Jehovah Jireh but he said it before he ever saw the lamb because when he turned to him and said son the Lord will provide the word he said in the Hebrew is Jehovah Jireh he called him the Lord that provide before he ever saw the provision. Now that's the language of faith. That's why he was the father of faith. Well, something he didn't know. How in the world? Sheep don't graze right up on top of the mountain. How did that lone sheep get up there? 
God's working out something on the other side of the mountain. I can imagine as he started up in faith saying God's going to provide, maybe the sun, a blast of sun temporarily blinded a shepherd on the other side of a mountain and a sheep just slipped out of the fold that he didn't notice, started nibbling its way up the side of the mountain. The answer is coming up one side while the problem's coming up the other. But the answer can't see the problem. And the problem can't see the answer. But when they get to the top and go as far as they can possibly go, they're going to meet. And you don't know what's coming up the other side of the mountain. So encourage yourself in the Lord. Hang in there. The answer's on the way. You're going to get a promotion. And if you've got a, a big enemy after you, God's got a big promotion. And all the word in the world you can do not going to change the thing. Really, make you feel worse. When Brother Tim, you ever worry? Sure I do. You ever can? Just Tim calls it concern. <laughs> but we all have things that bug us. I got, I got a message I preach sometimes on uh, bugs, ticks, and goats. That bugs me, that ticks me off, and that gets my goat. <laughs> now, you'd always have to be an American to understand that. But, but uh, there's some bugs, ticks, and goats in life. And you just, you just keep trucking. That's all I know to do. And uh, if the sun's shining, keep trucking. If it gets dark, keep trucking. Uh, in the Psalms, David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. What else does it say? What's the next? Thou what? Before me. Thou. Thou what? Thou anointest. The anointing came after the valley. God anoint me to go through this valley. God said you go through the valley and the anointing's waiting for you. So sometimes it, 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 it's the valley that leads you to the, to the uh, anointing. Well, God bless you. That's just some little rambling thoughts, some things I've learned along the way. Don't get distressed. Don't use all your energy crying and whining. And complain. You know, when you whine, you just let the devil know you're in the territory. I've seen, you, you know, y'all have any whiners? And some folks I've wanted to say, you want a little cheese with your whine? <laughs> Wine and doesn't do a bit of good. Have you learned all that? I believe I've done it, you know. When all the griping and grumbling's over, he's still God. You just want to embrace those things and learn from them. And then let it go. Get ready for the next lesson. When all the problems you've gotten there are solved, I got news for you. There'll be some more. Man's a problem looking for a solution. There's always going to be problems. and uh, Who ever heard of a, oh, I want the victory. NGO, you want the victory? You know what victory means? Fight. There's no such a thing as victory without a fight. So when you say, I want the victory, you say, let's fight. Because that's what it takes. <laughs>